Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this celebration of the establishment of the Carroll Family Professorship and the appointment of Dean Jinmin Q as the inaugural Carroll Family Professor at the School of Engineering. The Carroll family's generous gift to Tufts and the School of Engineering was inspired by the family's shared commitment to and lifelong interest in education. They have a long history with Tufts and they previously supported the Carroll Family Scholarship, the Carroll Engineering Education and Outreach Fund, and the Linda Abriola Graduate Fellowship. We are truly grateful to the Carroll family for their support. And we're lucky to have Steve and his daughter Julia, both Tufts alums, in the audience tonight. Your gift helped us to attract and to recruit Dr. Jinmin Q, our new dean, who will be sharing his vision with us tonight. It is our hope that your generosity will continue to inspire others in our Jumbo community to also make their mark in bringing excellence to our university. Now I would like to invite Tufts University's newest trustee, chair of the School of Engineering Board of Advisors, and Tufts alum Steve Carroll to say a few words on behalf of his family. Steve. Thank you, Tony. Um, it's, <clears throat> needless to say, quite an honor to be here and to uh, uh, help inaugurate uh, the inaugural uh, professor of the Carroll Professorship and, and the new dean of the Tufts Engineering School, Jan Men Koo. Um, I was on the search committee, and uh, there was no question who my first choice was, and I'm so happy we were able to attract you, Jan. Uh, I thought I'd just say a couple of words about uh, the Carroll family and our philosophy. Just a couple, I don't want to take away from the main event. Um, we, uh, we, we've been fortunate and in, that, uh, in our luck, we've had the ability to try to figure out how we can make a difference and have an impact on the world around us. And as you can imagine, uh, there's lots of opportunity to do that. And so we, as a family, sat around and thought about what, what we could do to have that would have the most impact and would uh, have the most meaning to us and be consistent with our values. And one of our most uh, important values as a family is the idea that human initiative, uh, entrepreneurial behavior, uh, is probably the thing that can change the world the most. A single human being uh, who, who takes an initiative to do something really good and really positive can make an, an enormous difference in the world for, uh, for millions. And for us, stimulating entrepreneurial behavior is a very key and important value. And when we think about that value and we think about how to help individuals take that step, we think that the single most important thing that can be done is to help them uh, with their mind and with their knowledge and, and help them grow as human beings. And therefore, we think that education uh, and helping every person uh, grow and develop and learn is a really important mission. And as a result, much of our philanthropy is aimed toward education and finding ways so that, uh, that everybody, people, can, can learn and grow and have the opportunity to go out and change the world. One of the things that, uh, that I've noticed uh, in my involvement with Tufts is that First of all, well, first that engineering and or technical education uh, and technical initiative uh, uh, is leveraged. That when people are able to make technological leaps, it changes the world fast. Maybe not faster than other things, but at least fast. And, and, uh, and the Tufts Engineering School has been instrumental in the past in not only producing great engineers, but also producing great engineering leaders. And great engineers combined with great engineering leadership have a tendency to produce really wonderful results for mankind. So when uh, I first met uh, John Men in the interview process and, and how as I've gotten to know him, um, uh, it became quite clear that he is the embodiment of these ideals. Uh, he has, uh, for those of you who know him, uh, quite an interesting story and an inspiring one. 
John Min was a victim of the Cultural Revolution in China. And uh, s such a great mind was sent out to the fields to hard labor and told he couldn't get an education. And uh, he did something which, in my experience, is totally an anathema. He actually snuck into school. <laughs> Not something I <laughs> tried to do in my life. And was able to convince uh, a mentor and a teacher to, uh, to risk everything to teach himself and another person uh, and so that he could learn and grow and get an education, uh, the one that was being denied to him by a bureaucracy. Uh, and then when the world opened up again uh, for, uh, for Chinese students, he was able to pass an entrance exam and get a degree in mathematics, which led him to come to the United States uh, and Northwestern and get his master's and PhD uh, in engineering. And now, and, and, and that to me is many things. First of all, it's initiative, it's entrepreneurial behavior, it's a dedication to making oneself better, and then to take that education and to turn it into helping others through being a teacher uh, is quite, uh, well, it's the embodiment of what we believe in and stand for, and it's quite an honor to have him as our inaugural uh, professor. Uh, and if you look at his career, he's done many things with this education, including leadership in other places, uh, not nearly as good as Tufts, but other places. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and now he's the dean of the engineering school where uh, we're about to hear his vision, but where that vision and that initiative and that, um, that spunk will, will, I'm sure, make a huge difference in the lives of many people. And those, that difference in the lives of those many people are going to make a big difference in the lives of many other people and will change the world. And so for us, the Carroll family, to play just a tiny, small role in all of that is an honor and a privilege. So. Uh, I guess it's my pleasure to introduce to you the inaugural Carroll family professor, uh, Jian Man Q. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, as, you, as, as Steve said, that he was actually in the search committee. So the first time I met Steve was during my first interview at the airport. It was a huge committee. Uh, it was in the hotel conference room. And I was placed uh, in, on one side of this uh, uh, U-shaped table and the search committee sat around it. And I, I was so nervous trying to answer the questions. But I did notice Steve sitting on my right hand side on that row. And Steve didn't ask questions, so we didn't actually exchange any words uh, because I was only given about an hour. I was escorted in the room, then escorted out. <laughs> However, on my second visit to campus, I did meet with Steve and two other uh, advisory board members. So we had about 40 minutes conversation. And I came out uh, so impressed by uh, Steve's passion for education and his love for Tufts. And also, um, you know, his calm demeanor and his genuine smile, so infectious, you know. You can't help but the, the, to trust the man at your first sight. That was basically my first impression of Steve. So when the provost uh, called me, gave me the offer, and told me that he was going to give me the uh, Carroll family professorship, I almost the moment it says yes. <laughs> but you know, I was a seasoned, you know, uh, negotiator. I I pretended that I wasn't too excited. I said, "Well, thank you. That's a big honor." But I want to think about it. I will get back to you. Um, but in my heart, I already said I wouldn't accept this offer. So the first thing, or one of the first things that came on campus uh, last August was to uh, invite uh, Steve to join me for dinner. So we went to a restaurant in what, Haridas? Yeah. yeah, in Cambridge. And 
throughout the meal, I, I couldn't help but uh, feel in awe that sitting right across the table is my benefactor. And at Georgia Tech, I have this George Woodruff Fellowship. Uh, George Woodruff, uh, George W. Woodruff is the former chairman of Coca-Cola for many years, and uh, he died, unfortunately, in 1987, two years before I joined Georgia Tech. So I never met my benefactor uh, at that time. In Northwestern, um, my benefactor's name is Walter P. Murphy. He was a railroad industrialist in the Middle West. He passed away in 1942, way before even I was born. So I never had the fortune to actually meet uh, the person who actually supported me. And now, sitting right across the table, here is Steve Carroll. So I feel so privileged and fortunate. Um, and and um, you know, that, that has been a, 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 a tremendous, um, a tremendous uh, uh, a privilege. So, Steve, thank you, and thank you to the Steve families as well. So when I was told I was going to have this ceremony, and I was supposed to give a lecture, I was thinking about talking about something on my research. You know, I have passion for all the things I do, and then I realized that probably it would be nobody's interest to talk about atomistic structures of metallic materials, right? So I figured I'd talk about something else. But I thought that even though I'm not going to talk about um, uh, 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 technical stuff, I'd like to at least tell you the kind of things I do. So I, I, there are three bullets, more or less summarize what I do for my own research. Basically, I'm a modeler. I, I try to develop mathematical models to understand how engineering material behaves, to simulate under what conditions they fail. And knowing those things will help us to design structures that are safer and more durable. And here are just some examples of the system that I had worked on. Not necessarily these particular pictures, but these are the systems that I have worked on. And, and that's the uh, airplane uh, 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 engine, and the system I work on is that a little turbine, I mean, the, the disc there. And that particular uh, is actually the, the helicopter that we work, worked on, is the H-46 transport uh, helicopter. The particular component that I worked on for the Navy is um, this rotor hub, uh, and, and that's a pretty interesting project in there. And I also work on, for example, the solid oxide fuel cells that's being used by many of the trucks nowadays uh, as an auxiliary power supply. And lithium ion batteries, another thing that we've been working on for the last three or five years. Um, Microelectronic systems, so I got lots of support from Intel, Motorola, IBM, you know, the electronic companies to work on the reliability of microelectronics. And this is another current project for uh, the Department of Energy looking at the reliability and safety of the nuclear uh, reactors and also the spent fields on, on some of the storage of the spent fields. So, so um, just a flavor of, of what I do. Okay, now let's go to the actual talk for today. Um, it, it says, uh, when I first, uh, 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 Cindy suggested that we talk to uh, the future of engineering, and I said, well, that's a too big a title. Well, how about engineering education? Um, I said, okay, well, let's settle with the engineering education. Uh, now, when you, when you say, uh, when you, whenever you want to predict the future, uh, the, the first thing, the first instinct that you do is, is try to uh, look through the, uh, the crystal ball, right? I mean, you say, what, 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 what's going to be uh, down the road? But I never believed in that, I, and I don't have crystal balls. But being a Chinese, I have a better things to, to look for, and that's what I came up with. <laughs> um, but you can see, whatever the message is, not very helpful. <laughs> So instead of, instead of talking about the future, I'd like to spend the next maybe 20 minutes or so to uh, make an argument that education, particularly higher education, is dictated by the need of the society. Okay? 
And I'm going to use a three pivotal period of a time in our history to illustrate that, to back up my argument. And if that's the case, uh, if that's the case, then if we want to look down the future, the first thing we want to do is to examine the needs of the 21st century society and the economics, right? And if we can identify those unique needs, we might be able to come out with something that can guide us how to change our education to meet those needs. So that's the central theme of my uh, uh, presentation today. Okay, we can start with colonial uh, uh, time, right? Now, what are the social economic needs? So instead of going back to, to give you the history uh, of that, I can show you one uh, 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 excerpt uh, from the uh, 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 pamphlet that I printed in 1643. And I can read this to you uh, uh, out loud. After God has carried us safe to New England and we had to build our houses, provided necess necessaries for our livelihood, livelihood, livelihood and reared convenient places for God's worship and settled the civic gov government one of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate to posterity. And that was basically the backdrop for developing higher education in the colonial time of the uh, United States. And it was based on this need, most of Ivy League schools were uh, 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 established. Uh, in fact, the purpose of this school can be very well summarized by the founders of the College of New Jersey, which basically the former uh, Princeton University. Is though our great invention was to erect a seminary for educating ministers of the gospel, yet we hope it will be a means for ra ra raising up men very sexist uh, uh, at that time, <laughs> and that it will be useful in, or in other learned professionals, uh, professions, ornaments of the state, as well as the church. In other words, uh, I'm sorry, in other words, the universities at that time served a dual purpose. One is to educate ministers who were clergymen. The other is to educate future civic leaders to uh, help building the new social economic structure at the very early stage of United States history. So those are the dual purpose. And it was that time, you know, uh, the New Jersey, I mean, the Princeton, the Harvard, and all more or less started at that time, right? So um, at that time, the, the, the curriculum was very interesting. It, since it's new to us, uh, to the settlers, so the only thing they could do is bring the old educational system from the uh, 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 from England, right? So it's basically the old uh, uh, Oxford, Cambridge uh, uh, type of educational system, and uh, the, the 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 type of thing that study is basically a combination of medieval learning and, and devotional studies. Uh, basically with the goal, uh, goal of preserving the, 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 the confessional religion of piety, right? So it's basically the religion purpose. And if you look at uh, what they actually learn, is nothing but a compilation of this dead, static, old knowledge, right? And the way you learn is committed to memory instead of you know, uh, critically thinking about things. So, so that's the way it, it works. Um, in fact, uh, for the first 10 years at Harvard, Every graduate must learn how to read the Old and New Testament in Latin. Otherwise, you cannot graduate. That's one of the graduation requirements. So it's basically, you know, here's a typical uh, set of a curriculum for uh, uh, the university at that time. Uh, okay, let me go back to this. Uh, this system lasts almost like 150 or 200 years or so without a huge change for a very long period of time, until, until Civil War time, okay? Um, and Civil War has drastically changed in American society, 
you can drastically change American society. And one of the things is the uh, 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 acceleration of the industrialization and urbanization. And this actually happened maybe a couple of decades before civil war, you know, it's called anti-battle uh, period of time. You know, the uh, 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 urbanization started uh, uh, accelerating. And uh, also uh, the scientific and, and, and te technological knowledge is being increasing dramatically over this period of time. And business and industry start heavily relying on those newly, uh, new discoveries and new technologies. And, and that has caused a, a huge social change. In the meantime, in Europe, uh, scientific discovery and technology has, has developed much more advanced than, than in the United States. And some of the European universities, particularly the, uh, uh, the university in, 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 in Germany, uh, uh, has started introducing uh, uh, research in, and technology in their curriculum. And that's an attraction to the American universities. Um, Civil war, in particular, has changed the political system dramatically in the U.S. Uh, it's drastically increased the power of the government, particularly the federal government, right? And uh, uh, the other thing that's a social change is, is, is the, the gradual in, sort of uh, uh, emergence of a more secular society. The religion influence is, is getting weaker, okay? Now, so, uh, uh, because of the new realities, the old system that has lasted for the last 150 or 200 years no longer meets the need, okay? And I can summarize that uh, by a paragraph from uh, Andrew Carnegie, and he basically put it very bluntly. Uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, uh, but if you read it, you can, it's, it's, you can clearly tell it's, it's a very blunt uh, criticism of the existing of the existing uh, uh, curriculum, you know, learn a little about the barbarous and petty squabbles of a far distance past. We are trying to master languages which are dead. Such knowledge are, uh, is seem adapted for life upon another planet than this one, right? And it's a very, very blunt uh, criticism. And basically, the end he says, college education as it exists uh, is today, I mean, but as it exists is fatal to success in that domain, basically the industrial uh, uh, revolution, industrial progress. So, so you know, this social outcry causes tremendous change in the American higher education, right? And first of all is the curriculum has started shifting towards uh, knowledge or practicality and the utility of knowledge rather than just theoretical dead languages, right? So that's one big uh, uh, change. And the other thing is the empowered government, particularly central government, now have the ability to actually uh, 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 direct the strategies and the directions of a higher education, and the Morel Act basically is the starting point of all the, the proliferation of uh, land-grant universities, and that started many of the public schools, although uh, a number of states had started public schools way before that, you know, Georgia being one of the, uh, uh, the, the early states that actually started public school. But not until this uh, act was enacted by Congress, uh, the, the, the university system has not been fully developed. And, and, and comes with that is that most of the state universities started with the notion of teaching agriculture, science, and the mechanical arts. So, so comes with A and M universities in the US. Okay? Uh, and that basically pushes the curriculum towards a more applied, more practical aspect of, of education. And the private schools in the Northeast, like the, the, the Ivy's uh, in particular, uh, respond to that social needs, but not by adding engineering, rather they add in more of uh, you know, law schools, medical schools, business schools. So these are again, so, uh, utility of the knowledge rather than the theoretical uh, aspect of it, right? So, and, and the other thing that emerged later on was the concept of the universities. The early on are the colleges, liberal arts schools, but the universities that has both educational mission and research mission emerged during that period of time, during that period of time. Um, this is basically where um, uh, uh, the beginning of the engineering education in the United States, okay? Um, 
So that lasts uh, uh, not very long until uh, World War II, in particular the Cold War period. I think uh, uh, new changes are, 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 are happening, and the society has changed quite a bit. Particularly, uh, one of the things that have drive, uh, driven the, the society change is the uh, is the uh, veteran, uh, veteran that return home. Uh, let me see if we can catch this one. Okay, sorry. That return home, you know. Um, after World War II uh, and, and Korea War and so forth, millions of veterans and came home. Now, uh, 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 Frank Roosevelt was the president right after, uh, to the, toward the end of World War II, and he learned the lessons that this country, the mistake uh, 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 this country made after World War I. Millions of veterans came home, became homeless, no job prospect, uh, prospect, and they just create a huge social problem. So Franklin Roosevelt was the driving force behind the so-called GI Bill. And this bill provided a series of benefits to returning uh, 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 veterans. It provides housing assistance and, 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 and uh, medical you know, uh, training, all that stuff. And the, one of the most important thing of this bill did was to provide educational assistance to uh, uh, veterans. So uh, by 1956, uh, almost 80 million of, of, of veterans have taken advantage of this bill and have gone either to school or through some other training programs. So as a consequence of that, I mean, uh, this, this is an amazing statistic, you know. In 1947, half of the college uh, kids are, college, college students are uh, returning uh, uh, veterans. That's amazing uh, compensation. So what that did is completely change the compensation of demographics of the universities. So I'll come back to that. And also, uh, right after World War II, uh, uh, I think as uh, uh, Eisenhower uh, administration started continuing finishing the sort of a construction, infrastructure construction of this country, right? I mean, right after the, the, the Great Depression, we built uh, the New Deal on the, on the, on the Franklin uh, Roosevelt New Deal. We built so much of the infrastructure, but one thing we didn't do was the interstate highway system, and that's what under, uh, under uh, uh, Eisenhower. And then international-wise, uh, the, the, particularly during the Cold War, the, the, the Soviet Union sent their first satellite to space and carried the first uh, astronaut into space. And, uh, uh, and, and that brought up the space race and the U.S. didn't want to be uh, uh, falling behind. In particular, now the Soviet has the, uh, has the nuclear bomb and we were just so scared that one of the satellites uh, uh, could drop a bomb onto the United States. So this is basically the driving force behind national strategy during the Cold uh, uh, War period, right? And because of that, uh, it, 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 there are the number of changes taking place in, in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, higher education. And, and that would be the, uh, uh, I would call it the beginning of the warmathization of uh, higher education. And that's where, uh, and the reason I say that is that education becomes the mean of upward social mobility. In the past, before this, higher education is limited to a few elite of the society, and they use that mainly just to continue their, their social class. And because of the change in demographics, uh, and, and, and people realize that this is really a way for the lower class to move up to the middle class. That's when the American middle class was created. Okay, that's where uh, the, the creation of the middle class started at the time. Okay? And, and you see a rapid expansion of the college enrollment. Here, here's a, a, a plot showing you. You can clearly see the, the peak started right over there. That's, between, that's the end of World War II. You see a huge, huge increase. And that drops due to the Korean War and the Vietnam War. So and that's that period of time. But you can see clearly that's where the university truly become uh, a place for the masses. Okay, it's no longer just a few, few elite. And uh, a change in demographics. This is when women get into college in large numbers. Okay? And World War II created the employment opportunity for women. They have participated in the labor force than ever before, 
And many of them actually have done a lot of work, for, for example, uh, the, the coders, the decoders, you know, uh, uh, all of them are women, to, to, to use mathematics, use the, uh, uh, mechanical calculators to decode the Russian, uh, I mean, the, Russian the, uh, the German code. So that's when women uh, flocked into college uh, in those. And the other thing that I have changed the face of American engineering education is the intense federal investment in research. Okay, because we are afraid we are falling behind the Russians, because we are afraid of atomic bomb, we, and the federal government put millions and millions of dollars into higher education. As a result, there's rapid growth of graduate education in STEM systems, and there is a rapid growth in university research. University research really take, took, off, uh, uh, took off roughly the early 1950s, early, uh, uh, late 1950s, early 1960s. So that's when, uh, when, uh, when, when the university truly developed. So, okay, uh, I think I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm gonna skip this one I, because I also want to talk about the research. But, I'm gonna, but I, I do want to mention here though, that is uh, because of the Cold War, U.S. have a very clear vision and a goal what we should do internationally, what we should do to uh, 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 prioritize our national resources is defense. We do everything to protect our security and to protect our competitive advantage in that sense. So everything is trying to be isolated. And, and the reason is very simple. Our enemies are very clear. It's Russia, China, and you know, a few places in the, in the world, and, and the, the whole universe has a very stable structure. It's a conflict, it's called war, but it's very stable. We know who our enemies are, they don't change. They don't change overnight, right? So it's very clear. And, and so until uh, the, the, the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the world was a easy place to, to sort of uh, to maneuver. But for about 10, 10 year period, the country lost its aim. You know, Soviet Union is gone. We don't know who our enemies are. For about 10 years, 10, 50 years, we really don't know. The country was completely aimless, okay? Until about the, two, uh, the 21st century, and now we gradually get back on our foot as to what we should be doing going forward, okay? Now, the 21st century economy and, and, and social politics has been, I think, is much more complex than any of the other time periods. So I'm not gonna pretend that I can say anything about it. But I can offer a few observations. One of them uh, is that technology is becoming more critical. It's becoming the main engine for economic growth. And we can't live without it. We simply cannot live without it, okay? <laughs> it, it's so critical, right? Um, I'm sure you have experience. When you go to a cash register, the lady tells you, sorry, I can't take your credit card. My system is done, right? So, so, so Everything is, is, uh, uh, is depending on, uh, on the energy. So that's number one. Number two feature of, of 21st century economy is technologies are so pervasive. It's so pervasive, uh, you know, from self-driving cars to internet of things. It has permeated into every corner of our life, including the bad time stories, right? It has been everywhere. So that's number two. Um, now, number three, uh, technologies are changing rapidly, okay, changing rapidly. If you do anything related to e electronics, you know this famous Moore, uh, Moore's Law. What it, Gordon Moore is one of the developer, founder of Intel. He proposed was that the number of transistors in a single chip would double every two years. So basically, the exponential growth. Now, the technology in the electronics basically is measured by the number of processors that you have on, on it, right? And if you go to this speed, this is where we are roughly now, okay? And you can think of, you know, this mouse brain, I don't know how, where that got it, but then you got a human brain. We are getting there. We are actually getting there, okay? In other words, we could build a computer that is probably as good as human, you know, brains, but still, you know, remember, this is, these are exponential curves. It's gonna take a little while to, to get there. Uh, and what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the, the growth has been tremendous, okay? This is the, the newest estimate. They say, by 2015, there are about three times 10 to the 21st power of transistors, okay? That's a huge, huge number, okay? I think only the United States Congress can appreciate that. <laughs> 
Um, so, okay, this is another chart to show you how things have accelerated, right? It took literally thousands of years to have the first uh, industrial revolution. Then it took about 100 years each for the second and third one. The fourth one, it's about 40, 50 years. We don't know when the first, uh, fifth one will come, right? So the, the speed of the changing has been rapidly uh, increasing. And what is really amazing is the productivity. If you think about it, the last 50 some years, the half century, we have almost tripled the productivity. You know, in 1960, it's about 38. Nowadays, the 2009 is, 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 is over 100. So that's amazing speed to change the technology and change the social life, right? Um, so number four is that everything today is so complex. All the low hanging fruits are gone. If you need to do research, if you need to do development, it becomes so complex. And here are the 14, 14 grand challenges uh, identified by the National Academy of Engineers a few years ago. If you look at any one of them, it's a multidisciplinary, uh, and not only multidisciplinary, it, it is cross uh, uh, engineering, science, and, and, and many other fields. So it's complex. That's all I want to say. Okay. Now, the fifth one is somewhat uh, intangible, but is really true. And that's what I call the information on demand. That is, you really don't need to remember or memorize anything, right? If you want to do anything, when I prepare, I, I made a point, I, when I prepared this uh, set of slides, I did took out two uh, history books just to look over, make sure my, my numbers are, are correct, uh, the years are correct. But I got most of the information out of the internet, Google, right? If I need something, I Google it. I found it, right? So information is on demand. You don't have to have that in your mind, right? <laughs> uh, you can always get it when you need it. And not only information is on demand, even knowledge can be on demand, right? Knowledge can also be on demand. And that's very significant. You know what we teach? Remember the early time we asked the Harvard graduate to, to memorize this old new testimony? We don't need that anymore because you can always Google it, right? So it's got to have some implication on the, on the education, right? So now the sixth one is internationalization, right? You know, everything we do today is not just limited to one country. Climate change, water resources, pan uh, pandemics, you know, anything you say it's transcend, transcend the, the boundary of a nation. So that's another feature. Now, with all that features, all the new realities, what engineers should do in order to survive or be successful, okay? And here are the few things I, in my view, I can offer. So engineers must be adaptive to new emerging and often disruptive technologies. Okay, that's a skill you must have. Okay, that's a skill you must have. Two, you must be innovative, the out-of-the-box thinkers and entrepreneurs. Okay? And three, you must have a strong leadership and communication social skills. And, and, and fourth, be civic-minded, socially conscious, and service-oriented active citizens. And you know, I say that not lightly just for the sake of saying it, because many of the technologies that we're developing today have a huge social, political implications. Think about a gene editing, right? Think about a self-driving cars. There's a lot of uh, uh, social ethical issues involved, any of the things that we do. So it's extremely important that we as engineers have that uh, uh, in our DNA, so, so that we don't develop things that eventually be, uh, cause a disaster that could eventually uh, uh, lead to the uh, sort of, uh, you know, destruction of, of civilization. So that's important for us. So what is the most important thing to me is the uh, 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 Darwinism, that is, it's not the most, uh, the strongest, it's not the, uh, 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 the strong, it's, it's, the most in, it's not the most intelligent that, that survive, it's the one that's most adaptive survive. So if you be adaptive, you survive, that's how we did it, human did it. If you're not, then you perish, right, then you perish. Okay. Um, so, to educate people with that kind of skills, what will be the desired curriculum that you, 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 you should develop, right? You should develop. Now, I don't, I don't um, want to, to, to pretend that I know all the things, so I can't really tell you what the curriculum should look like, but I can tell you a few desired features of the curriculum. 
One of them, well, first of all, it's all about learning, okay? The educational system has focused too much on what to teach. We really should look at that way around what to learn from the student perspective. What do they learn? You can teach all you want to teach. If a student didn't learn, it means nothing, right? So we should look at it the other way from a student perspective. And that's number one. Number two, the curriculum needs to be flexible. In other words, you cannot have very rigid curriculum so the student have no choices whatsoever, right? Because the breadth in this case is important in my view, and the student interest is important in my view. So it needs to be flexible, needs to be relevant. By relevant, that means the problems has to be real world problems. You cannot use artificial problems to train the next generation of engineers. I mean, that wouldn't work. And third one is appealing. By appealing, I don't, I don't mean the being entertaining. I mean it's personalized. Meaning that, you know, we know what personalized medicine is, right? Because you design a medicine based on your DNA so that the most effective to your disease. Learning is the same thing. Everyone learns differently, right? Everyone learns differently. How can you design a learning environment that geared towards the individuals? And we have the capacity to do that. We have people doing that kind of research, like Professor Chris Rogers, one of those, right? They can actually understand, based on your personality, based on your, uh, your, your, your social economic background, they can design the system for you so that you learn most efficiently. So I think that's important. So that's what I meant by appealing. Uh, 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 prevention, in other words, you gotta have hand-on thing, experience. You gotta be able to let a student uh, uh, have their hands dirty and start building things. Because remember I said being creative, being entrepreneur is an extremely important skill to survive in the 21st century. And if you never let the student get their hands on any of the project, you're not accomplishing that goal. So I think experiential learning and learning by doing is extremely important. That's why the maker space is so popular nowadays. That's why you know, the, those, all these uh, 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 project-based uh, uh, the course and so forth. I was in Berkeley um, uh, last week, and they just built a brand new 45,000 square feet uh, 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 maker space called the uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob Center uh, by the founder of a co uh, So the experiential learning and innovative, meaning design and, and, and design thinking in every class. You got to you got to make sure that uh, just do the opposite of early universities, not. Uh, memorization, but creation, right? So do design. Design is the creation process. And multicultural, that has, we have to let our students be exposed to different uh, environment, different cultures, because that's the environment they will be working in in the future. So um, they need to, uh, significant changes to be made, in my view, to, to the current curriculum. Uh, but there's things that we should keep. We should keep them. And, the thing that we should keep are fundamental stuff, okay? You know, may not make sense to many of you in, in the room, but these are what I consider the fundamental things, the basic laws for thermodynamics, and Newton's law, you know, these are the basic things. You have to understand this, right? And, and not for the sake of knowing that equation, but for the sake of learning, uh, the, the process of learning it, you actually gain the skill of, uh, of analysis. So, so that's important, okay? Now, how do you deliver these, how do you deliver uh, uh, the contents that we just talked about? Well, um, the one, in one extreme is the so-called massive open online courses. And this is a, a type of, of, of delivering process where the student can uh, sign up online, the one professor teaches, you know, literally millions of people can take the class, right? And, and you do it on your own time, on your pace, and your own schedule, and so forth. And this was actually uh, more or less became popular about uh, five, six years ago. And basically right after the, the, the economy, uh, economic crisis. And the moment it appeared on the news media, the politicians love it. The state uh, 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 literature is love it. They said, well, okay, here is the solution for the state budget problem. Let's cut the funding for all the state universities and we'll do everything online, okay? And that has not become a reality yet. Okay? And part of it is the fine distinction, I wouldn't find it, this major distinction between education and learning a set of knowledge. It's all okay to do this, just to learn a set of knowledge, but you don't get an education. Okay? Education has to be experiential, has to be 
uh, uh, in the environment like uh, like Tau. So that's one extreme. Okay, and the other extreme, so called, I call it the anti MOOC movement. Um, that's a focus on experiential. Everything is hands on, project based. You know, uh, 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 that obviously it, this is good. This is great if we can just scale this up, right? You know, if you have to deal with a class of, uh, of 150 students, this will be really tough to do, right? So something has to be compromised between those two approaches. Now, we at the Tufts happen to be in a lucky place. We are a very small family. I think we could potentially afford to go focus more on this approach than the massive open online uh, 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 courses. So, um, and, and I want to throw one last slide before I end this, is that um, I don't know if you recognize that this is by, uh, by one of our presidential can uh, candidates said that, you know, he says that a uh, college degree is the new high school diploma and education should be available to all regardless of, of the, uh, 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 you know, anyone's station, right? And, and this is actually not new. I mean, and someone has said that uh, uh, years ago. <laughs> And I think it's true. I mean, I don't think that the second part of what his statement is true, but at least this part was true, right? Um, so, you know, in my view, in the very near future, in the very near future, uh, you're going to have a, a situation where the bachelor degree is basically providing a general education and uh, where you learn to be a learned person. Okay, well, let me cross the glass out. <laughs> Um, it, learn to be learn to be an innovator, to be a communicator, to be a leader, you know, all that stuff, right? In order for you to gain any employable skill in the 21st century economy, you really have to go to a, at least a master degree program. And uh, I can tell you a story. I was in a, a Facebook uh, last week, and the director of the aeronautics system in Facebook, believe it or not, Facebook has a, a division of aeronautics system that, where they build the unmanned solar powered airplanes that will go around circles and beam down to remote areas. Their vision is connect every warm body in the world through internet, through Facebook. So in those remote areas, satellite is not very effective because you cannot provide that bandwidth. So they have these uh, airplanes, each cover about 20, 30 uh, uh, square, uh, 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 kilometer in diameter. So you're going to have literally hundreds of airplanes covering the area, of, you know, like Texas or something, you know, doing that. And one of the questions I asked him was, tell me the composition of your team in terms of degree. He said 20% PhDs, 20% BS, 40%, I mean 60% of MS. That's the composition of the team. And some of you probably have seen in the article a very recent survey by um, Career Guy, Career Build. It's a, it's a, it's a, a website that, uh, that provides career services. Almost 30% of employers this year are hiring people with master degrees for positions that used to be for bachelor degrees. So clearly you can see that the requirement uh, for education is going up. And that's not strength because of the society complex, technology more complex, and there are more, thing, more things need to be learned. Therefore, going to a graduate degree to get a little more uh, specific employable skill become necessity. Okay, now, uh, I know my time is running out. Let me quickly summarize it. So what I try to convince you is that educational change is driven by social economic needs. So I use the three pivotal periods of, of, of our history. And in the 21st century, I think uh, uh, technologies are becoming more critical, pervasive, fast changing, and complex. As a consequence, we need engineers to have this kind of a skills, have this kind of a skills. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to close by thank each and every one of you uh, uh, to join us and appreciate your being here to celebrate this particular occasion uh, with us. And I also want to uh, thank uh, the president and the provost for offering me, uh, 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 for, for your trust in me by offering me this uh, prestigious professorship. Uh, 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 I, I truly appreciate that. And last but not least, I want to thank the Carroll family again uh, for your generosity. And I don't have that skill or capacity to change the world, but I can assure you that I will do my best to live up to your expectations. So with that, 
I was told that I, I was allowed to ask maybe one or two questions. Tomorrow there's one right in the front. Yeah. Hello again, Min. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. So I have two simple, two really quick questions. Number one, how do we make this vision happen at the School of Engineering? And number two, uh, will these presentation slides be made available publicly? Because I would like to show this to my, my students. Uh, let me answer the easier question first. <laughs> yes, I'll make it available if you want it and for the presentation. Uh, the first one is a, is a tough question. You know, I've been uh, uh, basically uh, struggling working on it since I, I came, actually a few months even before I came, trying to figure out what's the best way to uh, uh, make some changes in that, based on my own least view, and I've been talking to faculty and, and, and students and the staff. Uh, I have some ideas, and uh, I, I'm also relying on the advisory board's help. So in fact, uh, this is one of the agenda items uh, we're gonna put uh, on the advisory board uh, meeting in, in May. We're gonna talk about it. I also uh, I had spoken uh, with uh, Jeff, uh, Professor Jeff uh, Hopwood. Uh, you here, Jeff? Right, and uh, he is uh, chairing our curriculum task force, uh, curriculum task force committee, no, curriculum task force. So uh, that task force had to talk about this once. So he will be there for the board meeting to lead the discussion. So we would like to get a, a consensus and sort of at least through this process, take a critical look at what our, uh, you know, critical look at our current curriculum and see what are the things that we can change to uh, respond to the social uh, economical changes. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. So uh, in your little cartoon where the teacher is saying you want to be innovative and critical thinkers, uh, and then it's gonna tell you exactly what to do, in a sense, the accreditors are the ones that are telling you exactly what to do. So isn't that one of the biggest challenges to changing the curriculum is the accreditors come through and tell us exactly uh, and Tony, that, that's a really good question. I think that's something the, uh, the, the engineer faculty has been struggling for many years. Um, the situation is changing a little better now. Uh, the uh, ABAD is the accreditation body. Uh, in the past, if you go back 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, they have much more stringent and more granular requirements on your curriculum. And they have heard the outcry from the community and they're gradually changing it. So uh, they are moving from the direction of telling you what to teach towards the direction where telling us the process that you're gonna put in place so that you can continuously improve your teaching. So they are less, uh, they have less control of what the contents of, of it uh, uh, and they're gonna focus more on, do we have a process to improve it? So I think that's working towards our favor, uh, favor. but uh, I think you still need more work. I mean, the deans, the department chairs are constantly fighting with this ABAT uh, 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 community, and, and I think we're gradually winning that battle. Yeah, I, I think you're right, uh, uh, Crystal. Um, in Europe, uh, the higher education in engineering in particular, uh, for many, many decades, being always like, a, uh, you actually have to go through five years to, to get a master's degree equivalent to us. And they have a very, you know, in, in Germany and, and France and, 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 and many places, to get into engineering school is not easy you have to go through a very stringent series of tests to get into it, only top you know, certain percentage get into it. But once you get into it, you are almost uh, there to get a master's degree. So to, you don't get actually, you know, uh, to, 
to become a professional engineer unless you go through a master's degree. In the US, um, in the civil engineering arena, it's already uh, a reality. In civil engineering, it's almost uh, uh, mandatory that you have to have a master's degree in order to be hired at, at the entry level for structure engineering in particular. So I think we are going that direction as well. Europe has been a little bit ahead in that sense. The European higher education, particularly in engineering, has always been more practically oriented than ours. They emphasize more utility um, you know, over theories. I think there's time for just one more question. Richard? Thanks for the integrated historical context. It was wonderful. Given that the future is going to be the bachelors of science might be a general education. And given you said that we need fundamentals, and then I saw the fundamentals, you know, the usual mechanics and science and more mechanics and, um, and physics, isn't, it, isn't all you're saying, and isn't there a need for a fundamental change in the fundamentals? In other words, don't the fundamentals need to change, be much broader? It's a whole new way of thinking about the curriculum. Yeah, I, I know Richard, every time he um, asks a question, he has this very out of the box way, out of the box way of thinking things. I agree with you. Um, it's not that the that science will change, but the two things associated should be changed. One is the way we teach them, okay? And I think, uh, take a simple example of, of Newton's law, or second law of thermodynamics, right? These things don't change anymore. But how you teach them, in what context do you teach them, will make a huge difference in terms of student understanding, right? So that's one thing. Second thing is, now you start thinking about what are the, uh, what are the subject uh, discipline that constitute the fundamentals in engineering education, right? And we know the set of mathematics that has to be taken, and we know probably you know, the calculus, the integral uh, system of uh, algebras, and so forth. And so forth. But in the engineering field, it's actually pretty murky. And I've been in a number of situations where the entire faculty got together, was very excited in the beginning, so we're going to revise our curriculum, we're going to reduce the requirements. So everybody has that vision to do it, but once it comes down to the bottom, you know, we, we had all the vision and everybody was uh, uh, in favor of it. But what's come down to, okay, I want to take uh, the foundation mechanics, uh, uh, it's not that important. Maybe we shouldn't include that. Oh, no, you can't take foundation out of it. <laughs> and then you say, well, soil mechanics may not be important. Oh, no, 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 no. If you don't take soil mechanics, you can't be called civil engineers. The same thing with, uh, with, with the mechanical engineer, maybe probably with, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, electrical engineers. I mean, but if you really think about it, in the, uh, 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 even up to 70s, maybe even early 80s, some of the universities are still teaching in mechanical engineering curriculum, still teaching uh, uh, drafting and drawing classes, right? And everybody has to learn it. And uh, forging, I mean, the casting is another class. But almost none of the universities these days are teaching those courses. But at that time, everybody regarded this as the godsend. You've got to take those classes. If you don't do a drawing class, how can you be called mechanical engineers, right? So time has changed, the technologies have changed, we have CAD programs, we don't need the drawing classes, right? So there are a lot of things can be left out. It's just a matter of how we look at them. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again. I just want to thank Jinmin again for a wonderful talk. We look forward to working with you many years in the future and to the Carroll family for your generosity. And please join us for a reception. Thank you.